Pastor Johnny Ardavanis went viral last week for his comments in a sermon about the Democrat Party. Here it is, Sot One. I'm not a political commentator. I'm a preacher of the Bible. But certain things politically are more theological than they used to be. The Democratic Party is a demonic death cult under the power and influence of Satan. To vote for the Democrats is to vote for a platform that is building their platform upon everything God hates. Uh, the mutilation of bodies, the annihilation of babies in the womb, and the sexualization of your children. That is their calling card. That is what they want to do. They don't hide that. They have abortion facilities outside of the Democratic Convention. This is who they are. It's the most radical party in our country's history. So I don't see how you could be a Christian and vote for a party who promotes everything that God hates. Pastor Johnny is here with us today to help us think through this election. Why do we need to vote as Christians and who should we vote for? Also, we are going to discuss his incredible book, Consider the Lilies, Finding Perfect Peace in the Character of God. You are going to be so edified by this conversation. This episode is brought to you by our friends at Good Ranchers. Go to goodranchers.com, code Allie at checkout. That's goodranchers.com, code Allie. Johnny, thanks so much for taking the time to join us. Allie, thanks so much for having me on. Grateful to be here. Yeah. So people have already seen your clip. We played it last week and at the beginning of this episode. Um, but could you just tell everyone for context who you are and what you do? Yeah. My name is Johnny Artavanis. I have a wife, Katie, uh, two girls, Lily Jean, Scotty Joan, one more baby girl on the way. I'm the lead pastor of Stonebridge Bible Church in Franklin, Tennessee, been there for about a year and a half, really grateful for the people that God has entrusted me to help shepherd along with the team of elders I serve with, uh, do some resources online, and uh, really grateful to um, ultimately just be a Christian and, and yeah. thankful to serve. Yeah. Tell me how you became a pastor. You know, I uh, I thought being a pastor was the last thing on earth I'd ever, ever be. You know, I, my dad was a pastor, so growing up, I wanted to be anything but that. And uh, But ultimately, I was working at a student ministry camp in Central California, ministering with students. I studied accounting and finance because I thought I wanted to be, uh, maybe one day I would serve um, on the side and things like that. But I ended up, long story short, I got involved in juvenile hall ministry, started preaching in juvenile hall because that was the only way they would let me in. Yeah. Because there was a student there I wanted to go see, and they would only let you in as a chaplain. And kind of from there, I got connected with this camp called Hume Lake, and I was there for five years. And over time, after being in this evangelistic setting for so many years, I had a hunger and a burden to be in a discipleship context. And it was at that point I got connected, reconnected with uh, John MacArthur and went to work as the dean of student life at the Master's University. And then he allowed me to go back up to Hume Lake in the summers and said, hey, I want you to still have that connection with the evangelistic entity. So I went to Masters, and after a few years at Masters and still my involvement in Hume Lake, I was like, man, I, I have a burden for evangelism and discipleship, and I think just in God's providence, the only place in the world where you can focus on both of those things in a God-given fashion is the local church. And so mm. I think the Lord just kind of, uh, that's the burden He's put on my heart specifically, and yeah. I had started preaching at this church in Tennessee while I was working at Masters just as kind of a guest, and over time, they had it started really kind of around COVID. And hmm. that's Lord an just, interesting time to become a pastor. I, I know. Well, that's when they started, and they had no pastor okay, really gotcha. on staff. It was just a gathering of people. And I was, they had a guy that was teaching kind of in predom, you know, predominantly, but then I became their first uh, full time pastor about a year and a half ago. And okay. it's been really cool to see how the Lord has blessed our church and kind of a growing team, which has been really sweet. And we've loved the area and they've been really kind to us. This is an interesting time to navigate as a pastor. And maybe all eras are yeah. interesting times to navigate. Sure. But certainly, as you have argued, um, our politics are becoming 
more theological. And yeah. so pastors now have this responsibility to speak up about these issues that are considered culture war issues, but are yeah. really creation issues yeah. for the Christian. Um, you kind of went viral a couple of weeks ago for the comments that you made in your sermon <laughs> about the yeah. Democrat Party. What has that been like? You know, I think y y you mentioned it. It's a theological issue and not a political one. I grew up, with, I would say, with godly men in my life. I'm the product of many godly men that still speak into my life. Um, I would say it's kind of been seen, it's kind of been perceived as something you stay out of, you know. Um, but these are not political ideas. And I think, you know, I was listening to your book on the way here. You talk about even 25 years ago, you have Clinton signing the Defense of Marriage Act. You have rare and when necessary abortions. And so even those types of realities 25 years ago, I mean, when you're looking at um, political parties, you're talking about economic plans and things like that. It's not the aggressive and relentless shoving in your face of things that Jesus came to die for. And obviously when I'm talking to my mm -hmm. church, I would say that differently than if I was talking to and have talked to 15 year old girls that have had three abortions, the tone of that would be different. And so I think, and I can, we can talk about that more, but uh, ultimately I was burdened and uh, people in my church were looking for legitimate answers, you know? Yeah. And so I want to be able to navigate that with them from a biblical worldview. And Peter says that God has given us his word and given us everything we need pertaining to a life of godliness. And so there's really, it wasn't really difficult. And I said that in the clip, like, hey, this isn't hard for me to say, because I was so surprised that people wanted to hear me say anything on it. And obviously the virality of the clip was shocking to me because I had no idea just calling a spade a spade from a scripture was like so bold. You know, people said, well, thank you for your boldness. I had no idea I'm being bold where the scripture is clear. Mm -hmm. And so obviously when you're, you're preaching against, you know, the context of our cultural moment, most of the compromise is obviously within the church because we're either ambiguous about these things or silent about these things. And so, mm -hmm. yeah, I just mentioned what the Bible says just briefly. It was like a five minute clip in a sermon I was preaching mm -hmm. in John chapter seven um, or John chapter six. And that's typically what I do. I'm going verse by verse through the gospel of John. I'm 10 months in and I'm through chapter seven. So mm -hmm. it'll take me three years, but there's different moments within the gospel of John that I, I try to punctuate what's happening in the culture. But yeah, if you were just to get to your question, what's it been like? I would say it's been surprising and saddening and burdening um, because now there's a weight of responsibility and a desire to provide clarity where there's confusion and to live with conviction where there's cowardice. And I don't really see any need to equivocate where the Bible is crystal clear. Mm hmm. Um, you responded to a post that we've talked about, too, by Ray Ortland, who said, never Trump, this time Harris, yeah. always Jesus. Um, I don't know how common of a stance this is yeah. among Christians, but Ray Ortland, from what I understand, is not fully progressive. He probably aligns with us on a variety of theological issues. Sure. Um, and yet... This is uh, this is a position that I see at least some evangelicals hold. Yeah, voting for Kamala Harris because Trump is just so uniquely bad. How do we think about that? Well, I think you have to look at things from you have to get gather some perspective. Um, my friend Harry always says that the only gift you can't give yourself is perspective. Meaning you have to mm. kind of zoom out from That's the good. way that you're initially perceiving things, and you have yeah. to look at things through the eyes and lenses of Scripture. So he's saying that to your point because he doesn't like Trump. And to be honest, I think that there's probably certain things you could hone in about his life where you, and you've touched on this, I believe, just to go like, yeah, I'm not saying he's my best friend, nor do I want him to be my pastor. Um, I might not, I'm not flying banners off my truck necessarily. Uh, you don't have to be that type of an individual, but you have to look at the policies um, in a way that supersedes the personalities. And you also have to understand that the president is ultimately the leading figure of a coalition of 5,000 people that they'll elect into governmental positions. And so I don't know how you arrive at that position, honestly, uh, when you're thinking with the mind of Christ. Um, you know, you mentioned, hey, I don't know if Ray is totally progressive. And I left his name out of it, and I'm glad I did to a degree. Um, but I, I don't know how you arrive there when you just look at the uh, full-term abortions, the onslaught of sexuality, 
the absolute dismantling of the nuclear family, marriage, you have to, if it was, if it's me, you really have to choose to push past your conscience to be able to say, hey, I'm, I'm voting for Kamala Harris when she is totally opposed to, you, you put it in regards to the creation mm-hmm. narrative, um, and that's really what it comes down to. She is yeah. opposed to the biblical worldview like no one else in our country's history. And mm-hmm. I don't even, obviously, I'm not even sure if it's just her. It's She's representing, she's the figurehead of yeah. really people that are probably even more so against the God of the Bible. And we live in a, a country that's reaping the worldview we've sown, um, because the church has compromised even on that creation element, you know, there's, yeah. I think three or f- three to five s- Christian colleges in America yeah. that still adhere to a biblical account of creation. Yeah. So sometimes we look at the news and we go, man, what happened? I'll tell you exactly what happened. It's not just the culture is always going to be the culture. The world is always going to be the world, but the church is compromised on the ABCs of what it means to be mm-hmm. a Christian uh, yeah. or to follow the Lord. And now we've, kind of dislodge the fulcrum upon which every Christian's worldview should rest. And that's just, what does the Bible say? And if you yeah. don't believe the first sentence of the Bible, I don't know where else you're going to start believing. So right. uh, a lot of those things are, are tough. So to answer your question about Ray, I don't know how we got there, um, but I think it is, and I said it, a foolish thing to say hmm. and mal stewardship to say, hey, go vote for a person that is hell-bent on slaughtering babies. Um, Mm -hmm. It's unthinkable to me, I guess, to be honest. Yeah. All right, first sponsor of the day, it's Adele Natural Cosmetics. I love this company, a family-owned company. They make all of their own cosmetic and skincare products. And Arlene started this company because of her own health journey, she realized that she needed to be paying attention not only to what she puts in her body, but also what she puts on her body. So all of their products are completely non-toxic, all holistic, all natural ingredients, and they really work. I use, for example, their moisturizing spray every morning. I use their oil-based cleanser every night. I use their um, their uh, Blue Lagoon line for all kinds of moisturizers. I really love their stuff. When I'm not in the studio, I also really like their cream-based foundation. All their stuff is awesome, and I love knowing that it is really good for me and good for my skin. If you go to Adele Natural Cosmetics. Com and use code Allie at checkout, you get 25% off your first time purchase. Adele Natural Cosmetics.com, code Allie. Now, there are Christians who won't vote for Kamala Harris, but they see voting for Trump as compromise because of some of the things that he has said about abortion, sure. even saying that he's going to make sure that we have taxpayer funded. IVF. And of course, within that industry, we see destruction of innocent life as well. Yeah. Personally, he's pro LGBTQ. He's yeah. made that very clear. Um, and so I have heard, and this is not the position that I take, and I've articulated my own position several times, and I've already voted for Trump. But I understand where some of my sincere godly friends are coming from when they say, look, if I vote for him, this is just rewarding that compromise. And if the Republican Party realizes that they can take God and marriage out of their platform, they can present someone who is functionally socially liberal, and we keep voting for them, then they have no incentive to ever change. They have no incentive to listen to us as evangelicals. Um, What would your response be to something like that? You know, I would say, first of all, I I think from a political perspective, you would be far more informed than I would be. I'm a common sense Christian um, that looks at the news, reads articles, listens to the briefing, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, I would say, first of all, Trump has already displayed his malleability. He's moved stances. He already elected two Supreme Court justices or put them in positions to be able to overturn Roe v. Wade. We think he is compromised on the abortion. So I would say, well, yes, he is compromised. But then I would say, hey, if you ever watch a Democratic commercial, I watch them while I watch the NFL on Sunday. Mm-hmm. What they're touting about Trump is his strict 
radical position on abortion. He's going to yeah. take away your reproductive freedom, your your rights. He's going to, you know, he's not going to be you're not going to be able to have an abortion. So, we think he's compromised, which he is. But they're saying his position is so radical that that's the reason they have to keep him out of office. Mm -hmm. So, then I would say, yeah, you uh he's not a pastor and I referenced that in to my church just saying, "Hey, this man is a sinner. They're both broken people, but to vote for someone, I, I referenced it, is the Latin word votum, which means to make a choice. You have two options. Yeah. And I am totally okay with saying I am punching a ticket against Kamala Harris by voting for Trump because I'm going to do everything I can do to get Kamala or keep Kamala out of office. Mm -hmm. Even the language of to make a decision, decidere in Latin means to cut off. I want to cut off the option of Kamala Harris um, I'm not even sure if I can say her name. <laughs> I'm saying it wrong. By voting she doesn't for know Trump. either. She changed it like <laughs> yeah, five she, times. She does. I know. I know. Someone to correct. I've got, that's the one of the largest points of feedback is I say her name wrong. Oh, but, um, I didn't. I didn't notice that at all. I thought the, uh, you said it right, so it's fine by me. The um, so I would. I, I think as in regards to compromise, you know, I I wouldn't encourage someone to violate their conscience, but I, as a pastor, want to inform their conscience through the lens of Scripture saying, hey, we're choosing between two ungodly people, um, but I've seen Trump's responsiveness to mm -hmm. different Christians, um, and we may not know what Trump will do when he's in office. Yeah. I know exactly what Kamala Harris is going to do. Yeah. She's going to murder the babies. Um, and, and, and just real quick on the abortion thing, because people, this was a huge thing in the last couple of weeks. People say, so are you a single issue voter? Well, first of all, no, I'm not a single issue voter necessarily. I'm a Imago Dei voter, which means and includes morality, sexuality, authority of scripture, truth, destiny, origin. All of those things are wrapped up into what we see as, and the product of that is abortion. But if I had to make a stance on a single issue, I'm totally fine saying the murder of babies is the one. Yeah. So even even amongst Christians saying, oh, you're just a single issue voter, I'm just like, well, I think that's a pretty important yeah. issue because it's revelatory of a worldview. Yeah. And there's and there's nothing else like it. I you know, I hear a lot of people yeah. saying, Well, I'm holistically pro life or I'm pro life womb to tomb. Yeah. Which yeah. I think really dilutes what the anti abortion position is. Totally. It's like suddenly our immigration policy is just as important as whether a baby has a right to not be murdered, totally. which of course is not um, not the same thing. And and by the way, because I hear that a lot too, single issue, and I'm like, well, abortion is the single issue for Democrats. It's their it they are single issue it voters. Is. Actually, when I see people like Steph Curry or other people who say that they are going to vote for Kamala Harris and the reason they give every single person, whether it's Taylor Swift yeah. or Ben Stiller or whoever it is, every single person has said reproductive rights, women's yeah. health care, yeah. which are euphemisms for abortion. So if it's yeah. their number one issue, the pagans, yeah. why can't it be our number one issue in the other direction? Yeah. And we just, I think as Christians, we we do have a responsibility to uphold righteousness in the land and to prevent, you know, Jesus says, uh, you are the salt of the earth, not you can be or should be, you are. And one of the main things that salt does is prevent corruption. And one of hmm. the chief hallmarks of the corruption in our culture is that even many within the church have been lulled and doled uh, into the acceptability of abortion just as, yeah, it, it, yeah, we, we're not for it. And I think the more that I kind of think and pray through it, God loves babies. And so obviously I want my tone as a pastor to reflect um, a staunch conviction. And that's where even why I said, and I think necessarily to circle back to say, if I'm talking with a 15-year-old that's debating having one, I'm saying, listen, God loves your baby. He says in Ezekiel, that baby belongs to me. Mm -hmm. It says in Psalm 119, 74, I, that God forms and fashions us in the womb. Psalm 139 as well. So... It is, a, it is a sad and tragic indictment on our world and in our culture. 200,000 babies aborted every single day. Yeah, it is. Um, why not Jesus 2024? Why not we're the party of the Lamb and that's it and Jesus is coming back, so who cares? 
you know, Jesus has ultimate authority. That's what he says. Matthew 28, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, but he delegates his authority to individuals. And we can talk about this more as the conversation progresses. I am uh, totally believe that God is sovereign, which means that he rules and he reigns. He is the supreme authority in the universe, Psalm 93, our God reigns, Psalm 97, verse 1, our God reigns, Psalm 99, God reigns. But I think sometimes on a quest to elevate God's sovereignty, we can limit our responsibility and the privilege that we have. You know, um, That would be like Esther saying, okay, Hashuerus is going to murder the Jews in 127 provinces. Let's just entrust ourselves to the sovereignty of Yahweh. That's not the way the book goes. There's mm-hmm. not even the mention of God in the book of Esther. But you have Mordecai pleading with Esther to say, hey, go talk to him. And there's an, a, lo- a level of responsibility. She says, if I perish, I perish. And we all know the line and we like the story. But there is a passivity that I think cult- uh, Christians think is godly. But there's nothing godly about being passive, especially when morality is in play. I think, too— it, there's a misunderstanding of precedent. Sometimes we get this idea that this is what Christians have done for, you know, thousands of years. But if you look at Zwingli, if you look at Calvin, if you look at Jonathan Edwards, his, you know, his ministry to get the Native Americans blankets and, to, you know, there, those are, I'm, I'm picking three big reformed figures mm-hmm. saying that there was always this push to be able to, to care for other people and to address moral issues. And that's the, the responsibility of the church. So I would disagree with the Jesus 2024 thing. And I, I think in my clip, I mentioned, hey, listen, yeah, he is already king. Um, but we have the freedom also to be able to uh, try to sway uh, things in a way that uh, we would continue to have those liberties. And And I said in the clip that the establishment of the church, Jesus building his church, the gates of hell will not prevail we're not on defense, we're on offense. The continuation of the church is not going to be deterred by a political party. With that being said, there's a massive difference in the church in North and South Korea. And so, and Christians in America, we give $400 billion away to charity every year because we experience those religious freedoms. So I entr- I trust that Jesus is going to continue to build his church, but I'm also thankful and uh, try to and want to recognize that Part of the reason why God has used the church in America is because of the freedoms we have. And so mm-hmm. I don't want to lose those because the Lord has used them. Yeah. And we see that the government is instituted by God to reward Correct. good and punish evil. Yeah. When I look at Kamala Harris, I see that throughout her career, she has punished good and rewarded evil. True. I mean, the Harris-Biden administration has put pro-lifers, peaceful pro-life protesters in federal prison, a 74-year-old for three years because of her peaceful demonstration in front of an abortion clinic, even while rewarding Planned Parenthood. And I look at Donald Trump and I think, well, Donald Trump's probably going to pardon those people. And so that's rewarding good and hopefully punishing evil by defunding Planned Parenthood. So even just looking at the basic function of the government, Donald Trump seems to be more of the candidate of order than Kamala Harris. And I love how you put it in your, you just in that clip, you said we have a responsibility to help stem the tide of evil. Can Mm -hmm. you talk about that a little bit more? Yeah, and I think part of it is just going along with what I said regarding salt being um, a preservative, a preventer Mm -hmm. of corruption. It's also a purifier because it is disseminated into uh, the pollutants. And so when I say stem the tide of evil, we are called as Christians to shine bright in a world of darkness. That's even what salvation is. That's First Peter, that God has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light so that we can declare that light to the lost world around us. With that being said, even going along with what you said, mentioning Romans 13, that's the function of the government is to punish evildoers and protect those who do good. Um, that's the very basic function of government. And when government does the antithesis of that, we need to address that because that's part of our responsibilities as, as citizens. So um, I, yeah, just in regards to stemming the tide of evil, even for non-believers, um, we have a responsibility not just to share Christ, but for the morality and the authority of Scripture to reign in our world and in our culture. That doesn't mean we're you know, extreme Christian nationalists, and, and you address even the the euphemisms people use. No, we want to um, 
usher in uh, a world that closely resembles the worldview of Scripture. And I think that's why for the last 250 years, God has blessed our country to be the greatest civilization in human history mm-hmm. um, because we adhered in a way it, close to that. Yeah, because we love our neighbor. And if we believe that God is love, the best way to love him is to agree with him. Okay, let me tell you about Carly Jean Los Angeles. Y'all, these are my pants from CJLA. I love them so much. They're so comfortable. Cargo pants are back. I don't know if you know that or not. Let's get the wide shot so people can see the cute cargo pants. But they are officially back, and these are super flattering, really comfortable. And that's what I love about CJLA is that all of their stuff is flattering and comfortable. You can mix and match everything because it's very simple without being basic like you can look very stylish and on trend without being trendy which means that their clothes last a really long time i've got some items from carly jean los angeles that are years old and are just in style today as they were five years ago that's the beauty of a capsule clothing company plus this is a company owned by a family that loves the lord they seek to glorify god in everything they do so not only are you getting really high quality flattering clothing items from them you're also supporting a company that fully aligns with our values go to carlyjeanlosangeles.com use code ally b to get 20 percent off your next cjla order that's carlyjeanlosangeles.com code ally b i've seen this perspective a lot this is from a writer at the gospel coalition And he posted, it's okay if you're a Christian and you vote for Trump. It's okay if you're a Christian and you don't vote for Trump. It's okay if you're a Christian and you vote for Harris. It's okay if you're a Christian and you don't vote for Harris. It's okay if you vote for neither. And this is kind of where I see a lot of pastors leave it. And they feel like this is giving clarity to their congregation that basically we're above politics. We transcend politics. And therefore, whatever you choose is fine. I see this as confusion. I see their congregants looking to podcasts and TikTok and Instagram to tell them, okay, but what am I supposed to think? Which I'm just not sure is a healthy place for them to be. Yeah. Perpetual obscurity is never clarity. So that's even why. And you, you know, I I mentioned that there were pitfalls on either side uh, for sure. But I did say one on the left is the Grand Canyon, meaning like, yeah, if you want to be perceived as balanced and more and more, Honestly, Ali, I just hate the word balanced because it feels like you're trying to show that you kind of get, you know, I, I, you know, I understand that there are pitfalls here. So you never really make an argument. Uh, Part of what a pastor does, you know, I remember my dad telling me when I was 12, Johnny, what's the goal of preaching? One word, persuasion. You're Mm. making an argument. Mm. You're proving something from the text. And obviously when the text of scripture intersects with the political and moral world, I'm not trying to make suggestions. I'm trying to make an argument. Mm. And I think typically in the past, it has been acceptable to be able to say, hey, I want you to think through this with discernment. You're called, Matthew 10, to be shrewd as serpents, innocent as doves, First Chronicles 12, the sons of Issachar were people that understood the times. And so there was hopefully an informed worldview where you could assume that people were making um, educated decisions. Mm -hmm. But yeah. And I've, I've seen recently other pastors that have said, you know, this party's bad, but this party, you know, the Republicans are just as bad. Um, not at all, not at all. So in response to the, the gospel coalition writer, I don't know him individually or personally, I would just say that's no, if you're a Christian and if you're at my church, I would plead and persuade you. I would not just say, I want to do that. I would say, no, no, it's a sin to vote for sin. Mm. And obviously you, then you, the rebuttal will be like, what about Trump or whatever? I, I would just say, well, no, that's a less aggressive stance on what yeah. the left or radical secularism wants to do in dismantling the nuclear family, demolishing the authority of scripture. Um, mm-hmm. And so, yeah, I wouldn't subscribe to that mentality. You mentioned it, that it's confusing. But it's not just confusing. I think it's cowardice Hmm. Um, because you can't read the scripture and come to the conclusion 
I, I mean, I would have a hard time. I, I think even you mentioned Ray. I think Ray Ortland and I are going to be in glory together. I've, I don't know his heart, you know, but I have a hard time with what he said. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was, for me, confusing why no one else was saying anything about it. So I think, no, I would not subscribe to that. You need to be clear for God's people. That's part of what a pastor does. Yeah. Um, and I wanted to at least try to do that as, yeah. as best I can. Yeah. Clarity is a gift. I think some people confuse moral relativism and impartiality. They think they're being impartial, which, of course, God calls us to do, but really they're just being confusing or, as you said, yeah. cowardly. And I think it's different, too, because I've heard different older men that I really respect say I've never endorsed a political candidate. And I would say what I did wasn't even... I wasn't making an endorsement. Yeah. Hey, Trump's the man. Yeah. I was saying Kamala Harris is evil. Mm-hmm. And so you have to try to keep her out of office, which is different than me saying, putting my arm around Trump's sh- shoulder right. and saying, vote, 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 yeah. vote, you know, fist bumping him and taking photos, which I think he's a funny guy, but mm-hmm. but compromising those different things. So yeah. that would be different in my mind than making a, an endorsement of this individual. I've seen his character. I know how he leads his family. Yeah. He's, he loves the Lord, yeah. which I'm not doing. Right. Um, there's a lot of anxiety. Yeah about the future obviously there always has been because sure. we see jesus's refrain yeah do not worry do sure. not be anxious um but today i think all of us are worried no matter who wins what kind of country we'll have for our kids and for our grandkids will they have the same protections and freedoms that we have and a lot of people are dealing with fear and you've written a book about anxiety called consider the lilies um Tell me, before we talk about what's in it, what inspired you to write it? Yeah, no, I was really thankful for the opportunity to write. The inspiration behind writing was when I was working at that student camp, you know, there are a thousand new high school students that would come every week. They would leave on Saturday, and then on Sunday, another thousand would get bussed in. And within like three weeks of working there, I became accustomed to terms like panic attack, anxiety attack, Mm. self-harm, depression. When was this? What years? 2016, 17 through 22, okay. really, gotcha. was my involvement there. And I still go up there to, to preach uh, in the summers. And so that was just a unique world for me to navigate and was talking with 15-year-olds that were anxious. Um, that could have been a, over AP U.S. history or it could have been, I've had three abortions, will God ever forgive me? Mm. Massive spectrum. And then I found that the counselors and pastors that came alongside those students, if they weren't struggling with anxiety themselves, were at least wondering how to minister to those that were assigned to their care. And I started doing an optional seminar in the afternoons entitled, What Does the Bible Say About My Anxiety? What Does Jesus Say About My Anxiety? And it was during free time activities like paddleboarding and you know volleyball and flirting or whatever it may have been. But the students were coming really... Uh, the large percentage of them because they were so crippled by it. You know, at Mm -hmm. night at at camp, we have to distribute the meds uh, for students. Mm -hmm. And just over the last few years that I was there, that amount of medications that was being dispensed just for the students that were anxious um, grew exponentially. Mm -hmm. Then I went from, you know, you could say, okay, those are students. Not all of them came from solid homes. Some of them just were coming to Christian camp for the week because that was their opportunity to get away. Then I went from there to a Christian university where students attended Bible classes, Bible chapels, and went to Bible churches. And the issue was still prevalent. And I just began to really think through, like, how does God respond to the anxious? And I wanted to encourage them. And then obviously now I'm a lead pastor of a church. And the composition of struggles, there's a level of variance there. But whether someone is 16 or 73, there is that looming element of anxiety. And you see so many responses to our anxiety in the scripture that it's not a new, it's not a new issue. Obviously Solomon says that there's nothing new under the sun. So this has plagued the people of God for years and years and years. And there are other good resources that I have read, but not one with the predominant thesis that I wanted to pursue. And we can talk more about that, but that was at least the heart behind it. Yeah, tell me about that thesis. Yeah, you, so in in regards to just mainly what the book is about, you know, I just begin to trace how does God respond to the anxious in His Word, you know, and and I think 
it's probably worth mentioning that sometimes people feel condemned just for feeling anxious, but you have all these different figures in God's word, like David, who is a warrior and the man after God's own heart. At one point, he's going to pray in the Psalms. Every single night, I make my bed swim with tears. Yeah. You have Moses, who is the leader of two million people, the giver of the law. And he says, I don't want to go to Pharaoh. I, I, I don't talk good. He says, stutter, right? And I send someone else. And then you have Elijah, who's the prophet of faithfulness. He's going to stand shoulder to shoulder with Jesus Christ and Moses on the Mount of Transfiguration. And at one point after he defeats 850 false prophets, slaughters them, he's going to crawl into a cave and ask God to take his life. Mm. Then you have Job, who is the most blameless man on earth. Um, at one point, he's saying every single night, my life is tuned to the sound of mourning. Mm. And I, I mentioned those figures just to show you that those are four of the godliest characters in the Old Testament. And they deeply struggled with anxiety and despair. But the way that God responds to them is not by telling them, let me tell you why this is happening, but by telling and responding them, let me tell you who I am. Mm. And when God responds to Job, he doesn't say, okay, Job, let me tell you about the conversation that I had with Satan, and here's why the Sabaeans and Chaldeans and wind and fire attacked everything you had. He says, Job, gird your loins. I'm going to give you an understanding of my character. And for yeah. four chapters, God goes on and reveals his character. And at the end of the book, Job says, my ears have always heard, but now my eyes see. And when God responds to Elijah, it's the same thing. He gives him a nap and a snack, and then he proclaims his character. When David says, why are you downcast, O my soul? God proclaims his character. And when Moses says, I can't talk well, send someone else, God responds to Moses and says, who made man's mouth? And proclaims his character. And I mentioned those Old Testament examples, and sometimes people would say, well, how does Jesus respond in the new? And I would just say, well, be based on the reality that God never changes, neither does the prescription he provides as the great physician. And so when Jesus is on the mount, the sermon, giving the Sermon on the Mount, you have people that are anxious, you know, and I think sometimes, Ali, we think, oh, their struggles were so different than our own, you know, our struggles today, our anxieties today. But we have to remember that the, the Jewish people that Jesus was addressing were under the ruthless regime of Rome. They used to crucify men, women, and children for 40 miles leading to a city, that said basically don't mess with Rome. It was literally the Roman Tetrarch Herod who chopped off the head of John the Baptist. Um, this and kill you know the other, his relative that killed two million or all the babies in in Luke and Matthew. So it was an oppressive regime. And Jesus says to them, um, you know, don't be anxious. You know about what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, what you're going to wear for clothing. And he doesn't stop there. And I think sometimes th that's an important. A reminder that he doesn't just provide a prohibition. He provides the pathway forward, and then he gets him to think. And he says, hey, look at those lilies over there. And obviously the name of my book is Consider the Lilies because that's the way Jesus beckons his anxious followers to think because uh, psychologists think that anxiety is the product of thinking too much. Mm -hmm. Jesus says anxiety is the fruit of thinking too little about the character of God. And so he just says, hey, I want you to consider the lilies over there. They neither toil nor spin, yet not Solomon in all of his glory um, was provided for like one of them. Look at the birds over there. Do the birds elect captains of food acquisition? Do they have chief supply chain officers? No, two of them are sold for a single cent, it says in Matthew 11. But God takes care of them. And Jesus argues from the lesser than to the greater than and says, hey, if I care for the larks and I care for the lilies, how much more am I going to provide for those who are made in my image and mm -hmm. who have been blood bought by my son? And so he gets us to look to the character of God. And I think sometimes we pray, God, take away my anxiety, but our life has a very shallow rooting in the depth of God's character. Yeah. And when God is responding to all these individuals in his word, he, he wants them to know something uh, he wants them to know something deeper about who he is. And some, obviously the size of our faith is always in proportion to the size of our God in our mind. And so that's the focal point of the book is on the attributes of God that buoy the anxious, provide us with comfort, provide us with encouragement. And I think, Ali, sometimes we look at the attributes of God, which would be uh, his love, his wisdom, his sovereignty, which means he's in control. The fact that he's omniscient, which means he's all-knowing. Uh, the fact that he hears our prayer. Sometimes we look at those attributes like pieces of the pie that is God. So we think he's 50% love, 10% sovereign. But God is all of his attributes all of the time in full measure. So let's pretend you're going through something difficult. I remember when my 
friend's mom died in college, I, I watched the guy come up and slap him on the back and say, hey, God's sovereign, brother. You can trust him, which would be true, but God's sovereignty can never be divorced from his love nor his wisdom. Mm. And so all of these attributes have to be looked at comprehensively because um, God's not just the king of the universe. He's also a loving father. But if we view him only as a loving father and divorce that from the reality that he is the king who has established yeah. his throne in the heavens, then his love as a father is just sentimentality and it lacks the power that we need to know. Ecclesiastes 9, my entire life is in the palm of his hands. Yeah. And so I think we have a deficient view of God because we have a deficient at times commitment to his word. Yeah. Um, and, you know, there's so many different, obviously just a big piece of my heart, but you, the prohibition even in Philippians 4, 6, be anxious for nothing. But by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And then it says the peace of God will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. But he, does, he doesn't stop there. Paul then goes, therefore, brethren, whatever is pure, noble, excellent, lovely, dwell on these things. Mm -hmm. And there's no more noble subject, no more lovely subject than the character of the God we call Father. And so yeah. that's why the subtitle is Finding Perfect Peace in the Character of God. But Peace isn't so much something we find. It's something we receive when our minds are rooted in Scripture and mm -hmm. in God's character. Okay, I've got my own box now with Good Ranchers. And this is like the box for busy moms. This is the stuff. The stuff that's in my box is the stuff that is really easy to either eat just plain or to dress up and put in quesadillas, make a hamburger out of it, make pasta with this meat. This is the stuff that is very basic and fundamental for really good meals that your kids will actually eat. So here's what's in my Good Ranchers box. You've got 16 four and a half ounce plain chicken breasts, two one pound Angus ground beef packs, eight six ounce American Wagyu plus Angus beef patties, my favorite, two 18 ounce bone-in ribeyes, and a limited edition collectible recipe card featuring one of my chicken favorites. This is enough for approximately 37 meals so your family can can be eating healthy American meat every night of the month and then some. This is a huge time saver. I never have to go to the grocery store, pick out the right cut of meat, make sure that it's actually high quality and from an American farm. It just shows up at my front door every month on dry ice. And I've got a freezer full of meat that also offers us just a lot of peace of mind knowing that we're prepared in that way. Go to goodranchers.com slash Allie to check out my box. And when you use my code Alley, you save $25 on your order. That's goodranchers.com slash Alley code Alley. I am a mom, also a girl, a, a girl parent like you are. And Obviously, one of my chief sources of worry is thinking about their future, their safety, their protection. I try yeah. not to be a paranoid person. And I've heard many times, which, of course, I know it's true that God loves my kids more than my husband and I even yeah. do. But I also know that really bad, terrible, awful things happen to people yeah. that I would never allow to happen to my kids if I had the power to stop it, if I had the power to stop them from getting cancer yeah. or getting kidnapped yeah. or hurting themselves, I would, but God sometimes doesn't. And so how do we as parents acknowledge that God could let something really bad happen to our kids that we wouldn't and still have peace and still believe that he loves them more than we do? Yeah, it's a deep question, you know, and the longest chapter in the book by far is on the sovereignty of God and our suffering. Um, how do we reconcile those realities? You know, I'm a father to two girls. I would never want anything to happen to them. And I'm a child of God, and yet God allows me to suffer. Um, there's a long answer, and then there's, I'll give you a, hopefully a short one. Romans eight twenty eight. everybody is you know, familiar with if you've grown up in the church that God is working all things out for good and for his glory to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. 
many people stop there and they put a period there rather than a comma. And they understand that God working everything out for our good is our material comfort, our safety, our physical well-being. Uh, but the reason that God allows us to suffer is because suffering in the scripture in James and in First Peter are the very instruments that God uses to wean us from this world and to remind us that we're pilgrims. Um, we're on our way to a better country. And so we have to remember, even in our suffering, 829 of Romans says, those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed into the image of his son. What, so what's God's good plan for your life? I think a lot of people miss this. God's plan for your good is your conformity to Jesus. And the only way you're going to be conformed into the image of Jesus is if you are refined in the furnace of affliction. But if that objective, you becoming like Jesus, isn't good, you're never going to be able to have joy in any sort of trial in your life. And obviously you mentioned your kids, which, I, which is different maybe than a trial because you're, I don't want anything to happen to them. You know, even this book was written providentially while I thought our daughter was going to die. You know, we're just kind of pacing the hospital. They told us she had a terminal disease. And, and obviously my suffering and our experience pales in comparison with even some of the people that may read the book. And so I'm always careful. But the credibility of me being able to articulate the truth of God's word and suffering isn't because I suffered on your level, but because God's word is applicable to all ranges of human suffering. But why does God allow us to suffer? Why does he allow us to go through difficulty? The one answer is we don't always know. Mm -hmm. Hindsight's not going to be 2020. That's not, you know, sometimes people say this will all make sense in 10 years. No, it might not make sense till 10 billion years <laughs> when we've been with Jesus. But on a human level and an immediate level, we know that the testing of our faith produces perseverance and that perseverance character and the character imitation of Jesus Christ. And so much could be said there. Um, I would want to do it with a true words are not always easy to swallow. And so there would be a level of tenderness if I was sitting down with someone and I was walking them through something that they've gone through. And I'd always want to make sure that uh, they understood the full spectrum of the character of God, yeah. that he's not capriciously pulling strings. Hmm. And that's, a, I think, when that's when we divorce God's love from his sovereignty. We just get this idea that God's in heaven saying, let's give him a dose of difficulty. Yeah, And that's not the reality at all. He weeps with those who weep. He, it says in Isaiah and in the Psalms that he holds our tears in a bottle. And if you ever have a problem with the sovereignty of God and our suffering, just know that in the sovereignty of God, he caused the greatest evil to accomplish the greatest good. And yeah. that is in the death of Jesus Christ, who was not murdered against his will. He went to the cross willingly for the joy that was set before him. And so whenever we think that God's just exercising his sovereignty flippantly, we just have to know that it was in Galatians, it says he was killed before the foundation of the world yeah. because this was always God's plan. And so he he sympathizes, and, and you mentioned this in your book, that he sympathizes with our weaknesses, but he also knows what it's like to feel pain. Mm -hmm. Um, and so he, you know, obviously he, he understands and, um, that's why it's a, it's a broad answer, but I would never want to not include that he's, yeah. uh, in his sovereignty, his son suffered. Yeah. I've heard some people try to square God's sovereignty with his goodness and love for us by saying that God never wants bad things for us. He never wants us to be sick. He never wants us to go through bad things. I'm not sure exactly how they would explain it, that I guess Satan being the prince of the power of the air has that power and God has allowed that. But in non-reformed circles, I hear this a lot, that basically God never wants bad things for people. That's never the father's heart for his children. How would you respond to something like that? I would say that's not true biblically speaking, because it says in First Peter that we suffer according to the will of God. Mm. It says in Acts 14, 22, through many tribulations, we will enter the kingdom of God. Jesus tells his followers, the world is going to hate you because it hated me. So I would, and, and would want to walk carefully through an individual that is saying that, but suffering is a part of the will of God for our life, especially as Christians. Because if there was no suffering, there would be perpetual comfort here on earth, which would give us the illusion that this is our home. Um, so does that say that the Westminster Confession of Faith talks about this in detail? God's never the author of evil, um, but he does allow evil. 
but not just allow evil. He's he's orchestrating um, a perfect plan that uses evil to accomplish his good. And you mentioned Corey Ten Boom in your book, but Corey Ten Boom references um, a poem called the the I think it's the Grand Weaver that we only see the top of the the tapestry that God mm-hmm. is weaving, whereas God sees the under. Mm-hmm. And he uses the knots and he uses the wrinkles and he uses the mm-hmm. dark threads to accomplish his perfect plan. Yeah. Um, so God's plan isn't just for our good in this in this life. Um, it includes our suffering. And you can't get any clearer than that than Peter saying that we suffer according to the will of God. Yeah. We're sojourners, we're exiles, we're pilgrims. And one day he's going to wipe away every tear. Mm-hmm. Um, but until that day, we um, were foreigners. Last sponsor for the day is Covenant Eye. So one way that we can push back against the darkness and push back against evil is ensuring that we ourselves are walking in repentance and purity. Unfortunately, we live in a culture where pornography is ubiquitous. It is extremely accessible, even if you're not looking for it. It's on your timeline on X. It might be on your Discover page on Instagram. If you want to protect yourself, protect your kids from the predation of porn, then you need to check out Covenant Eyes. Covenant Eyes has been supplying tools and resources to people, to individuals and families who are trying to block all of their devices from pornography. They have tools that allow for transparency, even accountability with a trusted accountability partner. If you are fighting against your own addiction to pornography, go to covenanteyes.com slash Allie. You can try Covenant Eyes with my code Allie for free for 30 days days. That's covenanteyes.com slash Allie, code Allie. How do we pray against anxiety? What does that look like? You know, I mentioned it briefly, but we, I would say you don't want to just pray against anxiety because obedience is not just the absence of anxiety it's the presence of peace and joy in your life because joy is not an optional extra in the christian life it's an imperative rejoice always and again i say rejoice but i would say you have to learn how to pray um scripturally what that means is i mentioned it not just saying god take away my anxiety but god help me to trust that you're in control help me to know that you love me Um, Help me, Lord, to know that you know every nook and cranny of my heart. Even one of the chapters in my book is on, I mentioned the omniscience of God. So you're praying that, Lord, would you please take the truth of your word and plant it deeply into the soil of my heart. When David's anxious, you know, David is on the run from his father-in-law, Saul, for 10 years. He's living in caves. He's not always living in palaces. And he's saying, oh, Lord, you search me and you know me, you know, when I sit and when I rise. And he's presumably writing this when he's living in fear, running for his life. And so I just pray back the scripture to God. It's not novel concepts. It's biblical ones. Just say, okay, oh, Lord, if you do search me and know me, help me to believe that. Help me to know that when I sit or when I rise, you're with me. You perceive my thoughts from afar. Whether I go up to the heavens, you're there. If I descend to the depths, you're there. If I rise in the wings of the dawn, you're there. Help me to believe that everywhere I go, Lord, you're with me today. And you get to pray different scriptures uh, in the sense of, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. I know that Psalm 103, 19 says, the Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his sovereignty rules over all. But Lord, in my own life, I believe in my sovereignty. Um, Would you help me to know that you're in control? John 15 says to abide in my love. Lord, sometimes I theologically affirm your love, but I've I, I, I have not tasting and seeing that reality. Psalm 34 in my own life today. And so... We pray that, and then we pray that um, in conjunction and in concert with the people of God because faith is a community project. I think sometimes, you know, you may pray with your husband, but praying is, you know, if you're just going to stop in the middle of a conversation with your friend and say, can we just pray real quick and ask that God would give us a peace that surpasses all understanding because we know that he's wise and good, um, and just help him, ask him to, through his spirit, give us the conviction that's true. We need to pray that. Um, also together. So more could be said there. And then we have to also trust that when we pray, he hears our prayers. Mm -hmm. It's not a blind jump into the darkness. It's um, an intimate relationship. And intimacy with God is a prerequisite to receiving the peace that comes from God. Mm. And 
few people maybe feel the the presence of God's peace in their life because they're strangers to intimate, deep, committed prayer. Mm. So it's an important question. Consider the lilies finding perfect peace in the character of God. John MacArthur says this book is exceptional in every way, which is a really good endorsement. He's a nice guy. He is. That's amazing. So they can get this wherever books are sold, correct? Correct. correct. And I can't think of a more timely read. I mean, also very evergreen in that every generation feels like we are dealing with worse challenges than we've ever seen. And yet Correct. going back to the scriptures, going back to church history, seeing the plight of his people throughout history and that God's dictate was still don't worry, yeah. don't be anxious. That alone gives us a lot of peace for today. Um, something that I ask some guests to do the every now and then with the last few minutes that we have left is just to share the gospel. So could you tell us what is the gospel? Yeah, I'd love to. Uh, the gospel is first and foremost starting with the reality that God is the creator of the universe. Uh, Francis Schaeffer used to say that if I had 60 minutes to share the gospel, I'd spend the first 55 minutes explaining to an individual that they were made in the image of God. Because mm. if I start with sin, rather than the fact that we are created by God and for God, it's like starting a book in the middle without an understanding of the beginning. Good point. So we're made in the image of God. Uh, the Bible records in Genesis 3 that there is a real historical fall of man where the cosmos is fractured and sin and death entered the world. And now mankind is alienated from God and there needs to be an atoning, a covering, a payment uh, for our sin. It says in Psalm 51, 5, that in sin did my mother conceive me, which means in contrast to what some people may think, you're not born good and then tainted by your environment. You are born sinful. Ephesians 2 says that we are born dead in our sin. We're enemies of God. Uh, we're children of wrath in the sense that you're born sinful and nothing you do could ever earn your way to God. That's one of the things the religious leaders during Jesus' day thought that by works, by their religious devotion, they were going to bridge the gap between them and a holy God. Going back just real quick to the element of God as creator, he's also holy, which means that he doesn't tolerate sin. He's not the bigger and better version of you. He's not quantitatively different, meaning that he's just bigger. He's qualitatively different, which means he's totally other. And God's holiness means that there is total separation from us and sin. In the Old Testament, one of the things that God provided for his people was a sacrificial system where the payment for sin would be satisfied temporarily covered uh, because God is holy. He's also just. Sometimes people say you have to understand the bad news before you can understand the good news. I don't know why people say that because I don't think mm. anybody wants a God that is indifferent towards sin, right? You don't want to, you wouldn't want a judge that said no biggie to injustice or sin. And so because God is holy, he punishes sin. And in the Old Testament, we see um, kind of a foreshadowing of what Jesus would do. The sin would be their justice would be poured out on a substitute. And then the sinner could have reconciliation, a right relationship with God. All of these things in the Old Testament for thousands and thousands and thousands of years, I just imagine. And because the Bible's a story and not just a theological uh, box, check boxes, uh, they were saying it's not finished. More sacrifices, more sacrifices, more sacrifices. But when Jesus comes onto the scene, a real historical man 2,000 years ago that walked the earth, uh, John the Baptist says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Because he was born of a virgin, he not only died, because people say he came to die for our sin, but he didn't drop down on a Friday, go back up on a Sunday. He not only had to die for us, he had to live for us. He had to be tempted in every way we were tempted, yet without sin. And he lived a life of total sinless, blameless perfection because he satisfied God's law in all the ways that we never could. Then he was slaughtered on a cross, that is a historical reality. And God poured out, Isaiah 53 says, 700 years before Jesus died, poured out the full measure of his wrath towards sin. You know, God hates sin. Sin must be punished. Jesus said, I will bear it. And on the cross, it says he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. And the chastisement for our peace fell upon him. Um, but he didn't stay dead. And this is the apex of history and the apex of the Christian doctrine 
is that three days later, Jesus rose from the grave. That is a historical and verifiable reality that Jesus rose triumphant from the grave. And what that signifies, Ali, is so important. It means that it's the receipt given to us by God that first of all, Jesus was God. He's not a prophet. He's not just a good man. He's not just a moral teacher. He is God. And it says in Romans 1, 4, that he was declared to be the son of God with power by the resurrection. So he's proven to be God. But not only that, it's the receipt given to us from God that on the cross, all of the punishment towards sin was satisfied in the person and work of Jesus Christ, which means that if you give your life to him and you believe in Jesus, and that's the key. How do I receive this? How do I receive the forgiveness of sins? Well, you can't do anything. You just believe that Jesus paid it all, and that's one of the great hymns of the Christian faith. Jesus paid it all, and our response to that is all to him I owe. Obviously, much more could be said, but in short, God is a holy God, and he sent his holy son to pay the penalty for our sin because you never could. He saved us from the wrath of God in eternal hell, and he rose from the grave, and now what he gives us is his Holy Spirit and the peace of God. And obviously, my book is about finding peace in anxious times, but no one can experience the peace of God unless they're at peace with God through mm-hmm. faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you for having me on. Mm-hmm.